This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. The indications for pleural drainage are diagnostic to collect samples for cytologic, biologic, or chemical analysis, and therapeutic to remove large fluid collections and improve respiratory function. Pleural drainage can be performed at the bedside with a single thoracentesis or, for continuous drainage, with the insertion of an intercostal drain. The use of ultrasound guidance permits the selection of the best site for the access to the pleural effusion, a step-by-step, real-time visualization of the lung structures, the advancing needle, and reduced risk associated with the procedure. This video demonstrates ultrasound-guided placement of a small bore, pigtail catheter, for drainage of a pleural effusion. The two most common indications for placement of a pleural catheter are drainage of the pleural space in a patient with pleural fusion, empyema or pneumothorax, and endocavitary administration of a drug. It is mandatory to check for major contraindications for the procedure. These include coagulation abnormalities, skin infections, skin wounds, or skin that has been otherwise compromised, or the inability to obtain a clear acoustic window with a pre-procedural ultrasound. Gather the necessary equipment. You will need an ultrasound unit with basic software. Use the brightness mode generally known as B-mode, to locate the structures of the chest and the pleural effusion. The unit should also be equipped with the appropriate probes, a convex probe with a frequency of 2.5 to 3.5 MHz, or a cardiac probe with a frequency of 2.5 to 5 MHz. Available drainage kits may vary in length and diameter of the catheter. Your selection of catheter diameter depends on the type of pleural fluid that appears to be present. A larger diameter should be preferred to drain an empyema or hemothorax. In this video, we will use a drainage kit equipped with an 8 French flexible pigtail catheter, a metal stiffening cannula, two fascial dilators, an echogenic blunt needle with a pointed stylet, and a guide wire with a J tip. The stiffening cannula will facilitate the straightening of the curled tip of the pigtail catheter during insertion. The introducing needle has a pointed stylet that, when removed, exposes a blunt tip. The dilators are to facilitate gentle dilation of the tissues of the chest wall. The catheter, stiffening cannula, needle and dilators are hollow, which allows them to slide over a guide wire, according to a Selden jerk technique. For the collection of pleural fluid and continuous in situ drainage, you will need a large syringe, a three-way stopcock, sterile drainage tubing, a collection bag, and sterile sutures. You will also need specimen tubes in which you can collect fluid samples for culture and sensitivity analysis. Sterile gauze dressing is needed for the puncture site. The procedure is aseptic. You will need a sterile gown, mask, and sterile gloves. To prepare the patient's skin, you will need a cleansing solution, such as 2% chlorhexidine and sterile gauze. You will also need sterile drapes and towels, a sterile sleeve to cover the ultrasound probe, and sterile ultrasound gel. To provide local anesthesia, you will need a 10 milliliter syringe filled with 2% lidocaine. Appropriate hand washing is recommended before wearing the sterile gloves and garments. Before starting the procedure, put the cannula into the catheter and straighten it. Then, place the stylet into the needle. Next, assemble the drainage system by connecting the drainage bag with the drainage tubing and the tubing to the stopcock. To prevent any aspiration of air, close the stopcock off the patient. Position the ultrasound probe in parallel to the intercostal space. Hold the probe firmly and perpendicular to the chest wall to obtain the best acoustic window. Normally, the visceral and parietal pleura are juxtaposed and moving with respiratory cycle. In contrast, the pleural effusion is shown as an anechoic space between the two pleura. The optimal acoustic window should provide clear visualization of the entire ultrasound field. You should be able to identify the structures below the probe. These include, from surface to depth, the skin, the muscles, the parietal pleura, the visceral pleura, and the lung parenchyma. The pleural effusion appears as a space between the two pleurae.
To perform the procedure safely, there should be a width of pleural effusion of at least 1.5 centimeters. Ultrasounds can also provide quantitative and qualitative information about the nature of the fluid, since it can detect suspended particles and septated fluid collections. Adhesions or intrapleural septae increase the risk of complications such as bleeding and injury to the lung parenchyma. In this case, you should consider abandoning the procedure. When appropriate, before starting, explain the procedure to the patient and obtain written informed consent. Coagulopathies should be thoroughly ruled out and, if possible, corrected before the procedure. Whether to carry out the procedure in a patient at risk of bleeding should be based on an individual risk-benefit evaluation. The use of a small bore catheter is safer in all patients with coagulation abnormalities. Position the patient for the procedure. The selected position may be supine, laterally recumbent, or upright while sitting, according to clinical conditions and possibility to expose the best acoustic window. In this video, we describe a lateral posterior approach in a mechanically ventilated patient. After the positioning, perform a complete ultrasound examination of the thorax. The most suitable point of insertion should be the spot at which the maximum width of pleural effusion has been detected. Mark the point of intended insertion with a skin marker. Using gauze soaked in a sterile disinfectant preparation, thoroughly disinfect the skin and place the sterile drapes around the selected site. Prepare the probe. With the help of a second operator, apply ultrasound gel to the probe and cover it with a sterile sleeve. Then secure the sleeve to the probe. The needle must be inserted in the intercostal space on the top of the inferior rib in order to avoid the neurovascular bundle, which lies beneath the lower edge of the rib. Using a 10 milliliter syringe with lidocaine, create an intradermal wheel where the skin has been marked. Anesthetize the superficial tissue and then the deep tissues. Gently aspirate at frequent intervals, checking for blood, to prevent any inadvertent intravascular injection of anesthetic. Now reconfirm with ultrasound that the pleural effusion is still visible where the catheter is to be inserted. Maintain the position of the probe on the chest wall and introduce the needle, with its stylet, to a length of about 1.5 to 2 centimeters through the skin, fascia, and intercostal muscle. Once the needle tip is close to the parietal pleura, remove the stylet and connect a 10 milliliter syringe to the distal part of the needle. Now continue introducing the needle while gently aspirating. Identify the distal tip of the needle as it enters the interpleural space, keeping the structures below in view. Confirm the penetration of the needle into the pleural space by aspirating pleural fluid into the syringe. Once you have reached the pleural space, disconnect the syringe and slide the guide wire through the needle into the pleural space. Confirm the intrapleural location of the wire as you visualize it with the ultrasound unit. Remove the needle and advance the dilator over the wire by its half through the skin and the parietal structures. To advance the dilator, push it firmly but gently against the skin twisting it as it advances. Slide the previously assembled catheter with the stiffening cannula in place over the wire. Make sure that the wire extends out of the proximal part of the catheter. Then advance only the catheter by the half of its length, holding both the cannula and the wire firmly to avoid any damage to the lung. Once the catheter has been inserted, completely withdraw the wire and the inner stiffening cannula together. With your finger, close the proximal hub of the catheter quickly to prevent any aspiration of air, which is a risk, particularly for patients who are breathing spontaneously. Now, connect the catheter to the pre-assembled drainage system. Pleural fluid can be collected for culture, cell count, and other laboratory tests. To drain the effusion and to introduce fluid into the drainage bag, use the syringe and the stopcock. Close the stopcock in the direction of the drainage bag and initiate drainage with the large syringe. When the syringe is full, close the stopcock to the patient and release the fluid into the drainage bag. Repeat these steps until the pleural fluid is completely drained and you feel no resistance with aspiration. 
Now permit the fluid to drain gradually by gravity, hanging the drainage bag on the side of the effusion, just below the patient. Before securing the catheter, make sure that all the fluid has been drained and that the effusion can no longer be detected with ultrasonography. If you see residual pleural fluid, slowly pull the catheter out by a maximum length of its half and begin to gently aspirate the liquid with the same syringe, as far as it is possible to drain fluid again, without feeling resistance pulling with the syringe. Repeat this procedure until the residual fluid has been removed. Be sure not to withdraw the catheter too far. The curled end of the catheter and its perforations should remain within the pleural space. If there is no residual fluid, disconnect the syringe and leave the stopcock open to allow flow from the patient to the collection bag. Be certain that you have the stopcock in the correct position. Now perform a post-procedural check with the ultrasound unit in order to check for the success of the procedure. Finally, make sure that all connections are secure in order to avoid accidental disconnections and entry of air into the pleural space. Secure the catheter with a surgical suture. Clean the surrounding skin and apply a sterile dressing. Make sure that the catheter is not bent or occluded by the placement of the dressing. All sharps must be properly disposed of according to local policy. A standard chest radiograph should be obtained after completion of the procedure to confirm that the catheter is correctly positioned and to rule out possible complications. Complications of ultrasound guided insertion of a pigtail catheter are few. However, injury to the lung or the vessels of the chest wall can occur during the insertion of the needle. In these situations, a hemothorax or a pneumothorax may occur. Other possible complications, also rare, include puncture of intrathoracic structures or intraabdominal organs. Rapid drainage of a very large pleural effusion, particularly in a patient who is not receiving mechanical ventilation, can cause discomfort and may also cause post-expansion pulmonary edema. Further evaluation is mandatory if the patient shows clinical deterioration or unexpected hypoxemia or if changes in the pleural effusion occur during drainage. Such changes include the presence of blood, clots, or air. In such instances, further evaluation is mandatory and a chest x-ray or computed tomographic study of the chest should be obtained. Depending on the findings, additional examinations or procedures may be necessary, such as insertion of a chest tube or surgical revision. Ultrasound guidance is currently considered to be the safest means of positioning a pleural catheter and draining a pleural effusion. This technique requires the development of skill in the use of ultrasonography and in catheter placement. Careful selection of patients for whom the procedure is appropriate, the presence of an experienced operator, and access to a detailed clinical protocol can minimize complications.